Hi, I'm Rob Cousin. Welcome to my shop. I wanted to uh, review this Wood River block plane. Ben Sawyer asked for it. So Ben, here's your review. Uh, I was never a fan of block planes. I always thought, why would they give you the smallest plane to do what's typically the hardest job, which is planing in grain? And um, then I got introduced to a brand that was a real premium plane, and that changed my mind completely. Did that for seven years, seven years, eight years. And then was introduced to Wood River. And at first I didn't really like it. It was bigger than what I was accustomed to. And, uh, and I forced myself, but actually it then became a point where I really liked it. And one of the things I liked most was about the way the blade is held in place. But let's uh, actually go through the process of sharpening it first. And then we'll, I'll talk to you about it specifically, uh, the low angle version, how it works. We'll demonstrate it. And, Whatever, but this is the part you have to know. Now, I really don't know where this one came from. It was returned to me. The blade looks like it's really been hammered pretty bad, so I'm gonna see if I can fix it quickly or not. I may have to grind it. I'm using a 1,000 grit Shapton stone and a little steel rule. I'm gonna employ what's called the Charlesworth ruler trick. And this is simply to create a little back bevel so that instead of having to work and polish and flatten the entire back of the stone blade you merely do a little wee strip at the very edge I've explained this in numerous videos now what I'm doing I'm keeping the blade within a quarter of an inch of this side of the stone on the opposite side I've got a steel rule that measures six inch by half inch and it's less than a millimeter thick that doesn't matter you just want to use the same one all the time that way you're not varying the angle I keep that positioned on that side of the stone I, di I distribute the pressure with three fingers and I'm kind of grabbing this corner with my thumb and that corner with this finger and then the middle finger uh, that my index finger applies pressure in the center of the blade and you just move it forward and back some do this I find that takes too long so I get a little more accustomed to doing it this way now I don't want to go too long before I stop and have a look and decide whether or not this is going to be doable now Okay, the problem is that whoever has done this before has actually rounded over this edge. So I can see the flat that I've created across here, but I also see the damaged rounded edge out there. Whether or not I can get rid of that without grinding, I don't know. I'll give it another <clears throat> minute or so and see if I can move that back bevel right out to the edge and eliminate that round spot. Or I may be able to get rid of it when I do the secondary and tertiary bevel on the opposite side. I'm using Honewright to lubricate this stone. This Trend diamond plate will rust if you uh, use water or leave water on it. But this Honewright, which is a water additive, and I, uh, I go through, uh, I, I use this, I think it's great. It, it won't prevent rust, but it inhibits rust, meaning if you leave your stone sitting in a puddle of it, you're going to find rust but it will certainly evaporate from the top surface before any rust will form. All right, let's take a look at that. I typically wouldn't spend half this amount of time on a brand new blade. Okay, I still see, I still see some rounded over damage out there. So let's go to the, uh, let's go to the grinding wheel and see if we can't just fix that. I use a uh, fairly coarse wheel, the coarsest one I can find. And I have mounted on my grinding wheel a, 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 a tool rest made by One Way Manufacturing. It's called the uh, Wolverine Grinding Jig. And the reason I like it is it's very robust, nice big heavy steel plate that acts as a great heat sink. Keep the uh, blade tight to the rest. Now, see how I'm touching back here? So I actually need to move forward a little bit. In other words, this is going to change the angle and take me a lot more time. So I'll just loosen that, tip it forward a small amount. Try it again. Okay, now I've moved it up here just ahead of center and that's all right. That just means I can get through this a lot quicker. Very light pressure into the stone. You don't want to create so much friction that you end up burning the steel. Nice thing about this tool rest, it acts as a great heat sink 
so when you have a blade where you have lots of surface contact, it actually helps to keep it cool. I like to keep moving the blade side to side. Periodically check to make sure that that line right across here is square to the end of the blade or to the sides, I should say. Now, I'm, it's fairly consistent, so I'll just keep going. And if you notice that you're dropping off to one side, you can see how if you can pick up on that line, I know it's hard to see, but it starts to drop off here and then it starts to drop off there. So I'll just pay a little more attention to the middle and see if I can't pull the middle down to where the low spots are on either side. I like to crown that wheel a little bit with my wheel dresser so that I know my contact where my contact point is. So if I have to go in and do a little bit of shaping, instead of wondering where I'm going to be touching the wheel, I know I'm touching in the middle. And this is, it needs to be reshaped. Okay, now you can see I haven't quite gone all the way out. If the light catches it just right, you'll see a little bit of the original bevel still there. But I'm going to go all the way through that because I want to get rid of that damaged area. What I'm actually doing is is uh, moving laterally, pushing in, engaging, and then disengaging while I'm still moving laterally. That way I'm not parked in one spot while I go from left to right to right to left, which means you end up grinding extra long in one spot, and it does not take long to burn the steel. I would describe my pressure uh, on the light side of light to moderate. And that still isn't hot enough that I can't hold on to it. So if you want some indication of how light the pressure is, that's a pretty good indicator. Better to take a few more minutes than to try to hurry through it, apply too much pressure, burn the steel, and then you've got to essentially grind down through that burned steel. So that's going to take this four or five times longer. Now, the blade does not have a lot of lateral adjustment in the plane. So I'm going to grab my square and make sure that that edge is still square to the side. It's actually right on, so no, no worries there. But you only have a few degrees lateral movement, so you've got to be aware of that when you're grinding a new bevel to keep it essentially square to the side. Still a nice straight line here. One facet, if you allow the, the blade to ride up on the wheel, you'll end up with multiple facets on there, but we've got one. I still haven't gone all the way through because I can't feel a burr on the back side, and that's what would occur. Close, but not yet. The other nice thing about going slow is if you, as long as you're stopping frequently and checking, you're probably not going to do something that you can't easily correct. Now I can still see that area of damage right there, so I know I haven't gone all the way through. Okay, so I'm just starting, not in the middle. On the two outside edges, I can just start to feel a burr developing, which means I've managed to grind all the way through the edge, but I haven't hit the middle yet. see that dull spot. I don't know whether you can pick that up in the camera or not, but I can still see that dull spot right there in the middle, so I know I haven't managed to get all the way through. So the burr is moving from the outside edge into the middle on both sides, but not all the way. And while I'm here, I might as well show you. This is the wheel dresser that I like to use. It's got multiple little wheels and mine are almost worn out. But that really 
opens up the surface of that wheel and makes it far more aggressive. So if your wheel gets clogged and your cutting speed really slows down, stop, address it for a few minutes or a second if it takes, and you'll go back to finding it far more aggressive. Probably actually uh, deal with that where it is right now on the secondary bevel, but I'll rather do it. Okay, I've got a burr all the way across. And I can't see the guy I can't see the dull spot anymore. And the final thing I'll do before I leave here I do it is I'll check to make sure I've kept that square. So I'm referencing off the side, looking out the window, and just verifying that that's nice and straight or nice and square. All right, now we'll go over here. So I've created that secondary. Uh, that back bevel on the 1000 grit. So what I'm going to do now is come over here to my 16,000 and polish it. Once I've done that I don't have to do this again to this blade. I use the 300 grit side of this stone to go in and flatten that ceramic stone. Use the same steel rule. Just going to get the crud off of it. Lay the blade down. I usually lay it so that the outside edge is off the opposite side and then I pull it in and then if there's any burr on there it'll fold up and get out of my way. Work the full length of the stone. Again, staying. try to stay within a quarter of an inch of that edge. The farther in you come the more you're going to alter that, that uh, angle on that back bevel. This only takes about 15-20 seconds at the most. It's a small area. I know it's a big jump from 1,000 to 16,000, but because the surface area is so small, it doesn't take very long. You can go to an in-between stone if you like, but I don't think it's necessary. Okay, so now the back of that blade is nicely polished. You can see a nice shine on it. You get it just right? Yep. Okay, so now we're going to do the bevel. What I've done right now is a one-time procedure. We don't ever have to do that again. So this is what I would do if the blade was dull. Come over to my 1000 grit, reference off the primary bevel, which is easy to locate because the blade's fairly thick, so it gives you a wide primary. Get three fingers along the cutting edge, feel for it. Once I find it, park yourself there, raise it up a few degrees. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now I removed the grinding burr when I polished the back bevel. So now that I feel a burr again, this is the burr I want, I'm feeling from my, what we call secondary bevel. And on a brand new surface like I just did, you'll be able to go in and actually see corner to corner that little secondary bevel. Can you pick up that, pick that up? Now once I've done that and I verify it with the burr, then I come over here to the 16,000 register on that same primary bevel, raise up a degree or two higher than I did on that previous one, and spend about 10 seconds working a new bevel, we call a third or tertiary bevel, light to moderate pressure. I don't do anything to the corners on this one, I keep it straight. And then the last step is to remove any burr that may be left. Just a few seconds. All right, that's all there is to it. Now wipe off any of the moisture. Okay, let's uh, put this together, try it out, and then talk about some of the characteristics of a low angle block. I'm just pulling this shoe back so it won't be in the way. 
There are multiple grooves on the back side, so you want that to coincide with the two little grooves right here. And as the blade gets shortened, obviously you're going to move forward. Now I'm just going to look and see where that blade is. Okay, this is the old lever cap from the original Stanley 60 and a half. Now that needs to be tight enough that it'll hold that in place. And I can tell just from having used it, and that's not enough. It's still not enough. That's good. Okay, now I'm going to move this forward a little bit. That really isn't functioning as, as I would use it yet. Now, turn this over, and I see the blade is projecting high on that side, so I'm going to... <coughs> move it. Now there's your lateral adjustment so you may have a little more than I suggested but you don't have a lot so you have to pretty much keep that blade square on the edge. Now I'm sighting down the sole and I still see it high on the left side plus it's also projecting too much so I'm going to straighten it out a little bit. Retract it. Now you notice that I took the pressure off. Makes it a lot easier to adjust with the pressure off. However the nice thing about this is with my thumb, I can still keep enough pressure on it that it doesn't allow it to move accidentally, doesn't fall apart on me, and then just quick flip with the right thumb and I'm right back to where I want, which is the cutting pressure. Now I'm, I popped it off again because I'm not quite parallel to the sole. That looks a lot better. Still projecting a little too much. Now I'm going to close my throat down just comfortably. That's, that's not serving a purpose yet. This is a piece of uh, bird's eye maple, and I'm just going to plane the end grain. Uh, this came off the saw, so it may take a couple of passes before I get it flat. First thing I'll do is come back here. Need a little more projection. Cut a little chamfer on the back side. That's so that I don't end up tearing out fiber when I cross the end. And then. Okay, now that's a bit of a heavy cut, so I'm going to pull that in a little bit more. So these are the end grain shaving, shavings off a piece of eastern maple. Now I'm going to see if I can get them even thinner. Pop the lever cap, pull it off a little bit more. Now I'm not sure what these would be measuring, but... I would tend to guess that they would be somewhere right around the thou. I'm a little bit shy on one side, so I moved the blade a little bit. No, it went too much. That's probably a comfortable. Doesn't take a lot of effort. It gives you a nice smooth finish. Now let's do one more thing. Let's plane the edge of a piece of figured maple. Now there's a piece of western maple, but it's got uh, a lot of figure in it, which means it would have a tendency to tear. So what I'm going to do to prevent that is I'm going to close that throat down so that the gap is very minimal. And we'll see what we get. I can take a lighter cut than that. A little wax on the sole. Now, you can't run your fingers on it, but I'm running mine, and it's perfectly smooth. There is no tear out anywhere on that. So, Let's discuss this. You have two options. You have a standard angle and you have a low angle. So what's the difference? Well, if you take the lever cap off, there's no traditional frog on a block plane, but if we consider this the frog surface or the bedding surface, on a low angle plane that's, 20, that's 12 degrees. Because the blade is on the top side, if you're going to factor in the angle with which you're meeting the wood, or what we call the angle of attack, you would take 12 plus the approximately 25 degrees on the primary bevel, 
but then you remember I raised the blade up a couple of degrees when I did my secondary bevel and a couple more when I did my my tertiary so let's say I added four degrees to that primary so we've got 12 plus 25 plus 4 is 41 you should know the math better than that mm -hmm. you weren't thinking either were you it was 40 or 41 you're right 41 okay so we're planing at 41 degrees if this was a standard angle block plane we would have that same 29 degrees on the blade plus 20 degrees that's the bedding angle on a standard angle block plane so now you're planing at 49 degrees which is actually higher than a typical bench plane so I'm the nice thing about this is that you can alter the angle of attack by simply having a second blade with a different angle on the blade or altering the angle that you have on that blade so when you use the low angle you can start lower and go up standard angle you're forced to start at a minimum of 45 degrees and go up so you've got a greater range the other thing then probably the single biggest difference is that when you put it together because of that low 20 angle degree on the bedding surface uh, 12 degree on the bedding surface the distance between the top of the cap and under here or where you hold it is lower i find it nestles in your palm much better than a standard angle where you're up here and it also allows you to be pushing more behind the blade instead of on top of the blade so probably for for an ergonomic reason more than anything else i prefer the low angle block anything you can do with a standard angle you can do with a low angle because you can alter the angle on the bevel and that all alters your cutting angle um, i like the uh, I, I really like this this is probably my favorite part it is so convenient to be able to just pop that off make your adjustments snap it back in place other block planes you've got a big spin wheel in here that you've got to adjust and you're never going to get it back to the exact same spot every time this is just really quick and I like when it comes to planing I like the mundane things to be nice and fast and that's probably one of the biggest advantages to that particular plane of course the price is right you can't beat that it's half the cost of of the uh, premium block planes it's a short sole so you can expect the tolerances to be right on if you want you can back off these edges they're rather sharp so take a file in fact I'll show you how to do it it's quite simple just take your file and file on a 45 degree I file from the sole out to the side and just knock off those sharp corners makes it more comfortable to the hand and it's less likely to get a uh, raised ding on there if you happen to bump into a, another piece of metal in your tool tray or wherever you're keeping your planes. So that's the Wood River low angle block plane. It would be my choice for a block plane. Mine gets a lot of use. It sits right there front and center and uh, I probably use it every time, every other time I'm use, uh, building something I'm using a block plane. Hope that answers your questions. If you have any more, hey fire them off to us. We're happy to review it for you and let you know what we think. See ya.